So if you've been watching my channel for a while, you probably noticed that I love 486s. But I think it's time to shift gears and fast forward a couple of years into the Socket 7 era. An era that I've really been looking forward to spending some more time exploring, actually. And really, it's no less special to me. I have so many fond memories from this time in history as well. So today I'm going to get started by doing a quick video on a motherboard restoration. Don't really want to call it a repair because, well, mostly works. But as you'll see, 25-year-old motherboards, they do need some TLC. So this is the Gigabyte GA586 ATV. And I got this one on eBay recently for a pretty good price. Included a Pentium 133 with a pretty nice looking heatsink on it. And it also came with some of the expansion brackets, including this one here for a PS2 mouse, which is pretty huge actually. You don't usually see these included. But there is a reason I chose this particular board. And uh, the reason is I actually fried very similar gigabyte board about five or six years ago. And I won't get into too much detail about that situation, but let's just say you should never put a Cyrix Media GX chip in a normal Socket 7 board. Yeah, I learned that the hard way and it released the magic smoke. It was uh, way beyond repair, unfortunately, but it still got put to good use. The uh, chipset actually went to somebody in Brazil who needed a replacement. And I used it for parts and soldering and desoldering practice numerous times over the years. So when I saw this one, I thought it would be really nice to finally replace it and hopefully get it restored to its former glory as well. Intel's popular 430VX chipset was released in 1996 and was often called the Triton 3. But despite being newer than its predecessor, the 430HX, that chipset was pretty high end and really only found its way onto more expensive boards. In many ways, the 430VX was more of a budget successor to the original Triton, which was the 430FX. It did improve on it marginally with better PCI buffering, faster supported memory timings, and a few other things, but the one of the biggest features that Intel debuted with the VX was SDRAM memory, something completely new at the time and could improve memory performance quite a bit. But as you can see here, yeah, not all VX boards actually included an SDRAM slot. Another feature that the original Triton lacked was USB support, and the 430VX does actually support it, but again, like this board here, they didn't all implement it. But what this board lacks in new features, it makes up for in quality. It's a really solidly constructed board, and Gigabyte was definitely known as one of the more reputable brands at the time. The board includes 256K of onboard pipeline burst cache memory, which is much faster than the old SRAM used on early Pentium systems. But a nice feature they included is this slot right here. This is a coast or cache on a stick slot for doubling the cache memory to 512K. I've actually got a couple of these uh, coast modules here, so I'm hoping that at least one of them will work in this board. When it comes to CPU support, by this point in time, pretty much all the boards supported the dual voltage Pentium MMX processors. And there's a jumper right next to the socket here to switch between single voltage and split voltage modes. I've actually got a uh, Pentium 200 MMX uh, CPU here, which is technically the top end chip that this board will support. And uh, we'll definitely give this a try. Once again, I just wanted to give a big thank you to Lee from Nova Scotia in Canada, who uh, sent me this chip along with a big box full of other retro PC parts a few months back. So thanks again, Lee. And yeah, as expected, like so many Pentium boards of this era, it has an RTC module. This one here is the Benchmark BQ3287, and with the date code of 1996, there is no way the battery inside will have any life left in it. So it's definitely going to need to be replaced. But thankfully, Gigabyte went to the trouble to include a socket for it instead of soldering it directly to the board like so many others did. Overall, the board is nice and clean looking with no visible damage, except for this oddity right here. <laughs> you've seen exploding capacitors before, but I bet you've never seen an imploding capacitor before. I have no idea how this happened, but the only explanation I can think of is that someone couldn't resist squeezing it for some strange reason. But if you've ever seen something like this before, let me know in the comments, because I'd love to hear your thoughts about how it got like this. And yeah, obviously I can't leave a capacitor like that on the board, so I'm going to do a full recap job. The caps I'm going to use are Panasonic FM Series Electrolytics, and they are excellent quality, low ESR caps that I use for a variety of purposes. And at any rate, they should definitely be better than these 25-year-old mystery brand imploding models on here right now, that's for sure. 
All right, so let's get this thing tested out. I've got an S3 Verge graphics card installed here. Uh, I still have the Pentium 133 in that I'm just gonna leave for now. I've got a compact flash to ID adapter with DOS 622 on it and a pair of 16 megabyte EDO RAM sticks installed. So should be everything we need. Let's see what happens. Oh man, that fan sounds horrible. Definitely gonna have to add that to the list. I don't know how much of that I can take. And yeah, it looks like it posted. It's got a uh, date code of 1996 on the BIOS there. It looks like it's version 1.12. And yep, as expected, the CMOS battery has failed and we get a checksum failure as a result. So some boards would actually hit a total roadblock by this because it loads the defaults and it wouldn't include the correct hard drive geometry that's needed to boot. But this one actually detects the drives that boot up. So in theory, I should be able to just hit F1 here and get into DOS. So let's give that a try. And yeah, it looks like it's working. But obviously anything I set in the BIOS won't be retained and the timekeeping will also be wrong. So first order of business will be to get this RTC module replaced. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about RTC modules in this video because I have covered them quite a bit in the past. So check out the video description if you'd like to learn a bit more. I was hoping to keep the board looking as original as possible and I wanted to use a brand new Dallas DS12887 like this one here. But no matter what I did, it would always report a CMOS checksum failure when I used one of these modules. Uh, no battery complaints at all, just checksum failures. And I tried a couple of others that I have, and I know these modules work fine because I've used them in other systems. So I'm assuming it must be some kind of a compatibility problem with this board. I think it may need one of the less common DS12C887s with the Century Byte, but I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, I've got a better idea. The benchmark BQ3287 is basically a DIP module that includes the BQ3285 RTC chip, a battery, and a crystal oscillator. Exactly what Neckerware's awesome RTC replacement module consists of. And by the way, if you haven't checked out Neckerware's YouTube channel, definitely head over there and I'll include a link in the description. He's got some amazing retro hardware repair videos and has been a huge inspiration to me personally. He's really helped me to gain the confidence to pick up my soldering iron and to try a lot of things I just never would have done before. So definitely check him out if you haven't already. But anyway, I've got one of those uh, custom modules in my 386 board that I repaired a few months back. So I'm gonna try it out and see what happens. After going in and setting the correct date and time in the BIOS and then cutting power to the system for a while, I'm ready to test it out. And yeah, look at that, problem solved. Well, sort of anyway, I still need this module for my 386, but thankfully I've got all the required parts to build a couple more of these. Anyway, I've got a few things on the list for this board here. We're gonna build a new RTC module, swap out the fan, give it a full recap, and upgrade the CPU and cache. Let's get started.
oh, that fan sounds so much better. It's not really quiet, but let's just say it sounds like it's working properly at least. And you probably noticed I swapped out the regulator heatsink for a similar looking gold one. And although it's not really going to have any functional benefit, I did want to pass along a memento of sorts from my old fried gigabyte board. Later revisions of this board actually included this flashier looking gold heatsink, so I think it's a nice touch and hey, why not? And speaking of gold, I definitely like the look of these Panasonic FM series capacitors. They fit in well and I can rest easy knowing they're very high quality electrolytics and should last a very long time. No more imploding capacitors, I hope. The board's working fine after the recap, but there's two issues related to the CPU upgrade that I did. First, the BIOS doesn't detect the chip as a Pentium MMX. It thinks it's a classic Pentium or Pentium S. Really, it's just a cosmetic issue and probably one that can be easily addressed with a BIOS update. But second, and more importantly, the 3X multiplier does not work with this board with an MMX CPU installed. The 200 MHz chip is stuck at a 2.5 times multiplier for a maximum clock speed of 166 MHz. Thankfully, I've heard of this issue before and had some idea of where to look. All thanks again to NecroAware and an awesome video he did on pushing an old 430FX board to its limits. I'll include a link to that video in the description below. But basically, the issue comes down to a small difference between classic Pentiums and Pentium MMX processors. There are two pins used for setting the internal multiplier, BF0 and BF1. The processors have internal resistors attached to these pins, and on the classic Pentiums, both are pull-up resistors. And on this board, it appears that that jumper block is configured with this assumption in mind. The Pentium MMX, however, has a pull-down resistor on BF0, and a pull-up resistor on BF1. Don't ask me why Intel changed this, I have no idea. But if the board wasn't designed with this in mind, multiplier selection will not work right with MMX chips. An easy way to test this theory is just to install a classic Pentium 200 instead of the MMX variant. Thankfully, I've got one here that I can try. And if my theory is right, the three times multiplier's jumper configuration should work just as expected. And indeed it does, so this is definitely the problem. So I've reinstalled the MMX chip, and one last thing I want to try is to add a pull-up resistor to the BF0 pin and see if the 3X multiplier works. So I've constructed this little monstrosity right here. It's basically just a 2 kilo ohm resistor attached to a jumper. And I don't actually want to close the jumper on the board. I just want to attach it to the single pin for BF0, which is this one right here. And because this is a pull-up resistor, I need to attach the other end of this to a 3.3 volt power source. And the easiest way to do that is for me to literally just hold it against the tab of the I.O. regulator here, uh, near the uh, nut and bolt here, and that should give it give us 3.3 volts. So if, uh, if I'm right and my theory is correct, if I power on the system now, we should see a 200 megahertz Pentium MMX. So let's give that a try. All right, let's see what happens. Pentium 200 megahertz, there we go. So that did indeed do the trick. We've successfully set a three times multiplier. So I could easily solder up a resistor on the underside of the board, but that would probably cause issues with multiplier selection for classic Pentiums. And I don't really want to put wires and an extra jumper somewhere to enable and disable the mod. Honestly, I'm happy that I have a good understanding of why it's happening, and really that's good enough for me. I'm going to repurpose this 200 MHz MMX chip in another board, and instead I'm going to use this ceramic top 166 MHz MMX chip instead. Not totally top end, but it'll still be a nice upgrade over the 133 that was in there before. The only remaining piece I'd like to take care of here is the BIOS. As mentioned, it appears to be a pre-MMX era version and is probably the original release for the board. The retro webpage for it actually didn't include 1.12. The oldest listed there was 1.13, so I pulled it off and submitted it to the project through their Discord. Within a day, it was put up on the board's download page. And if you haven't checked out the retro web project, definitely do. It's a really valuable resource and it's growing every day. There's info there on just about every retro motherboard you could ever find. And I definitely encourage you to submit pictures, software, and BIOS dumps for your boards. Every contribution helps the community. So there's no change log to know what each release offers, but no doubt there's going to be a bunch of compatibility and bug fixes, so I really think it only makes sense to go for the latest release, which is 1.28 in this case. 
I'm using Uniflash here because I've had some pretty mixed experiences with some of the old manufacturer providing flashing tools. Uniflash works really well with Pentium era boards like this in my experience. And after a quick reboot, we can see the new BIOS string and a date of 1997. And our Pentium MMX CPU is now detected correctly as well. Well, that's it for today. It's a great feeling to breathe some life into an old board like this, even though it was working for the most part. Fresh caps, a new RTC, quieter fan, and the latest BIOS all mean that this board will hopefully be enjoyed for many more years to come. I'm happy to add a 430VX board into my collection after my misadventures years back, and I hope to use it for some upcoming projects as well. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more retro PC videos like this. And uh, also be sure to check the description for useful links including how to find me on social media and for a link to my blog. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.